Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on rights retention, exploring how the Plan S strategy could apply globally. This webinar is organised jointly by IFLA's Academic and Research Library section and headquarters, with the kind participation of Coalition S, and we'll be hearing from a couple of Coalition S speakers later in this talk. This webinar is specifically organised at times to work for the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan African regions. Um, Rights retention is a particularly interesting topic right now, and right at the heart of the dis discussion, the debate about how we can achieve open access, how we can make sure that more of the world's scientific production is available for all. And rights retention is one way of doing this. Clearly, this is, a, this is an issue that's an emerging issue. It's a plan that's only been out, uh, come out relatively recently. And there are still some important questions about how it could, how it would, how it might apply in different parts of the world. And so our objective today is to talk about this. How could rights retention and the plan air strategy work in the MENA in the sub-Saharan African region? To discuss this, we're very happy to welcome Johan Rurik, the executive director of Coalition S, and Sally Rumsey, the OA, JISC OA expert at Coalition S, to talk about the strategy, to talk about what it means to do. And then we're very happy to welcome two lead respondents. We have Dr. Al Walid Al Khadja from Qatar National Library, and Dr. Reggie Raju, Raju from the University of Cape Town, who will then respond, who will share their ideas and enter into conversation with Johan and Sally. Before we start, please be aware that this event is being recorded. Including, in the ch including the chat, and that we will subsequently post this on the IFLA website. We have muted microphone for this event, but if you have questions or comments, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. In particular, use the Q&A function, because then you can review and look at the comments that have been made by other people. But without further ado, I would therefore now like to hand over to close and hand over to Johan. So thank you for inviting me, Stephen, and thank you everyone for being present here today. Let me try and share my screen um, here for a minute. Um, let me okay. Presentation mode. There we go. Okay. I hope everyone can, can see it. I always check. Um, yes, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So today um, I, I will be, Sally and I will be talking about the uh, Coalition S uh, Rights Retention Strategy. I'm the executive, as Stephen already said, I'm the executive director at Coalition S. And Sally Ramsey, uh, Ramsey works at uh, JISC and is also one of our Coalition S uh, experts. And so we will both be presenting this. Um, because we think it's really important to um, disseminate our rights retention strategy, especially as there are a number of misunderstandings about this strategy. Why are we doing that? Because we, we hope to be able to extend the rights retention strategy, not only to coalition S organizations or members or uh, researchers funded by coalition S organizations, but also to, to other institutions, uh, universities, uh, research centers, and so on. So that's why we are talking to uh, organizations uh, related to higher education research support, staff involved with supporting uh, researchers in any aspect, of their coalition as funder uh, policy, but also of institutions generally, librarians who often support uh, researchers in uh, their quest for open access, research office staff and senior research uh, support staff uh, of various universities and, and institutions. That's our intended audience. Um, the agenda for today is an overview of the Plan S rights retention strategy. Uh, an overview of the resources that we put at the disposal of uh, uh, staff who wants to, uh, who is willing to disseminate this uh, this strategy further, and then there will be time for question and answers. The presentation will take about 20-25 minutes, and then there will be uh, ample time for for questions and discussion. I also always include at the end of this slide that if there's any discrepancy between what we say or what we happen to say uh, in a moment of week. Um, and uh, what, what is on our website, it's obviously what is on our website that, that prevails. Um, 
So without further ado, um, the rights retention strategy, uh, what are the key objectives of the rights retention strategy? Well, first of all, to make sure that all the research and all the publication that comes out of the research that is funded by coalition as organizations, that all that research is published, open access in any way, shape or form. By any way, shape or form, I mean, whether it's gold, whether it's green, whether it's by a transformative agreement, we don't care. The research has, that we fund has to become open access immediately on publication. Uh, and the rights retention strategy is specifically designed to um, address the repository part, the green open access part. So to make sure that all that research is accessible through a repository. So why do we why do we, do we adopt this approach, the rights retention strategy? Well, it's to ensure that also the research that is published by researchers in subscription journals or in hybrid OA journals, which we want to trans make transition to full open access journals, that also that research is made available in open access. And this allows at the same time our researchers to publish in as wide a variety of journals as possible, including those journals that are now subscription and hybrid. So we uh, second goal is to make sure that researchers by that means uh, retain sufficient rights to reuse their work as they choose. That is very important to us. So we uh, are of the opinion that the author should own their work even after review. Um, that, that version, the post-review version, is still something that uh, the, re the, the author owns and should be able to reuse in any, any way, shape or form. And we also, by doing this, by making sure that all the research, even that in subscription journals and hybrid OA journals, is immediately uh, made available in a repository, by that we want to put pressure on publishers to consider developing transformative arrangements or transformative agreements. Uh, or transformative journals so that they transition their subscription journals and their hybrid open access journals to full open open access. That is another one of our, of our goals. Um, so the, what is the problem that we seek to resolve? Well, the rights retention strategy has as its minimum requirement that the author accepted manuscript should be deposited in a repository with zero embargo. So zero embargo means that it's immediate. The author doesn't have to wait six months or 12 months to deposit it in a repository and with the CC by license. So that CC by license ensures that the author retains rights on that, on that, manus on that manuscript. Um, now, we have made this an obligation through the coalition as organizations grant agreements. This is uh, as of 1st of January, for instance, welcome and many other of our uh, of our, the organization's members of uh, Coalition S will progressively make this uh, an obligatory part of their agreements. But at the same time, we know from experience that many researchers will sign a publishing agreement with publishers that uh, gives away their right to deposit a AAM in a repository, a so-called copyright transfer agreement. Copyright transfer agreement means that the author transfer the, transfers their rights uh, to, uh, to, to the publisher. And this is something that we wish to, to prevent. But at the same time, of course, the researcher then is caught between a rock and a hard place because there is a contradiction between the researcher's grant agreement, which stipulates that they should publish the article in a repository, and the publishing agreement imposed by the publisher that's, that denies them explicitly this kind, this kind of right. So the, this is the reason why we developed the rights retention strategy. It's aimed at resolving this contradiction, namely, and it does so by taking the CC by that we apply to the uh, AAM, the author accepted manuscript, uh, to make that take legal precedence over any later copyright agreement. So the CC by that is applied to the AAM by the researcher on um, on the instructions of their, their funder, uh, functions as an earlier agreement that needs to be respected by, by the publisher. Uh, and that's the way it works legally. I'll, I'll say something about that later, later on as well. Um, this is our overview of uh, how it works. The, the, so the funder agreement states, as you can see, we start from the top. Uh, the funder agreement states that at least the AAM has to be published with a CC BY license and no embargo. 
uh, the author informs the publisher about this, that, that, uh, then when acceptance follows, following peer review, the author accepted manuscript um, must be deposited in an open access repository, CC by an open license. And then what is managed by the publisher is the so-called version of record. So that, that is can indeed be in uh, the hands of the, of the publisher, but we claim the rights to the AAM, so to speak. Um, so um, a little bit about that AAM, author accepted manuscript versus the ver version of record. We have to make it very clear that uh, when public, when it, when where publishers are concerned, we have a preference for the VOR. We, we do think that the VOR version of record has a number of advantages. It is the version of record. This is also the version that is maintained uh, and updated if uh, retractions or modifications must occur. Uh, it is also the, the nice version, so to speak. There's all sorts of bells and whistles that are added. And so we want to respect it and we want to pay for that. Wherever it's possible to pay for that, the Coalition S funders have committed to paying for it if the price is reasonable and equitable. Uh, so the AEM will only need to be made open access where there is no plan unless I, a plan S aligned way to make the VOR open access. So that is our incentive for the publishers to allow this, if you like. We want publishers to transition to a full open access uh, uh, world, and we are willing to pay for that version of record if the price is reasonable and equitable. So in any case, we encourage institutional repositories to hold a copy of that work, whether it's the VOR or the AM, to assist with long-term preservation uh, of, the, of, the, of the work. Um, so how will this work, or how, has this, uh, how have we made this work? Well, we have uh, applied three uh, steps to apply this model. First of all, of course, we need to update the grant conditions. Then secondly, we have to, mod the, to notify the publishers of this change in our grant conditions. And then third, we have to require beneficiaries in their submission to inform the editor of the CC BY license that has been applied uh, to any future AAMs that arise from the submissions. So how did we do this? Um, first of all, we, uh, we have and we are changing our grant conditions, uh, basically stating that uh, a public copyright license, either CC BY or CC BY ND, uh, CC BY ND only by agreement of the funder, will be applied to all future author accepted manuscripts that result from an initial submission, you know, where this uh, paper, where this publication is funded in whole or in part by the publisher, by the, by the funder, by the funder. So anything that is funded by a coalition as funder must carry this license. And then secondly, um, ask uh, the, the authors to specify the public license that has been applied and the source, source of their fund, funding. Uh, I'll give an example of that uh, later on. Uh, so that is what is now explicitly part of the grant conditions that are imposed on coalition as authors uh, across uh, all uh, the organizations that are part of coalition S. The second uh, step is notifying publishers of these changes because of course the rights retention strategy only works properly if the publishers uh, have been informed of the fact that this these rules now apply to all our contracts and to all the authors funded by ourselves and when there is an earlier agreement uh, of course uh, the, the, we do not want the uh, the publishers to be able to claim well we didn't know about this or we didn't know that this author was subject to your requirements that's why we have um, communicated this approach far and wide by webinars, by talking to uh, publisher trade bodies, and we have also invited publishers to respond to the AAM that are licensed CC by giving them five options. And until now, at least publishers have not explicitly informed us that they will refuse articles that come with the rights retention strategy language. Uh, this, all of this information will be incorporated in a journal checker tool that I will talk about a little bit later. The journal checker tool is a tool that allows authors to find out how the, jur the journal of their choice corresponds to the rights retention strategy or to other coalition as uh, policies. Um, and then step three, our step three is that we provide the uh, 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 templated language for our authors that they can include in any submission. Uh, they can include in the letter of submission or ideally they uh, include it in the acknowledgement section of the article itself because then you know it's there and it's basically these uh, uh, this very short uh, uh, 
this very short statement. Research was funded by organization and grant number and uh, informing the publisher that this uh, uh, manuscript submission uh, already carries a CC by license on any AAM that results from the uh, from this initial submission, making sure that the author accepted manuscript post review remains in the property of the author. Um, this is, for instance, uh, uh, welcome, uh, an example from welcome, welcome grant conditions, uh, as, as just given to you as a case study. This is what now applies to all welcome grants starting on 1st January uh, 2021. Um, for instance, they, since they are most since they mostly fund medical research of course they have made a very specific requirement of where that research has to be deposited uh, namely europe and med central um, they must be immediately deposited there upon final publication they have to uh, stipulate that cc by public uh, license and they must carry the the following the following language so this applies to um, to all uh, welcome uh, grants uh, starting on, on, on 1st of January. Uh, now, as I said before, uh, we want to make this easy to researchers. Uh, I already said the rights retention strategy is one of the strategies that we use to make sure that research is immediately uh, available in open access. We also do a gold open access. We also admit uh, transformative agreements. So how does an author know if an author wants to publish in any journal? How does an author know that that journal is compatible uh, with Plan S policies, uh, whether it respects that policy. Um, so that's why we developed the journal checker tool and the journal checker tool basically combines three pieces of information. It combines the journal title with the funder name and with the institution, because institutions, of course, carry transformative agreements that can allow that author to publish in open access. And that combination of those three pieces of information yields a result. Yes, this journal is compatible with planners policies or no. And when it says yes or no, it gives you uh, uh, an indication of how that um, how that works. So. Um, what you have to do, for instance, if the journal is a subscription journal, it will say, well, you need to apply the rights retention strategy. When the journal is a gold open access journal, the journal checker tool will say, well, you need to pay a gold open access fee. When it is under a transformative uh, agreement, the, um, the, the journal checker tool will yield as a result, well, you can publish there for free because your journal, you are part of an institution that has already paid for this journal via transformative uh, agreement. And the first iteration of that journal checker tool is available since November 2020. I invite you to check it out. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really nice and it works quite well. There are, of course, still a couple of, of, of bugs and uh, agreements that have not been taken up. But those are wrinkles that we will be ironing out in the next uh, few months. Um, so basically summing it up, what do authors need to do? Because that's what people always want to know. Uh, well, they need to inform the publisher that the AAM resulting from their submission carries that CC by public copyright license, um, including what we call the magic language. And then secondly, on publication, they have to deposit the AAM or the VOR, depending on the journal and depending on, 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 a, uh, on what is allowed, in a repository. Those are the two things that, that need, to be, need to be done. And now I'll hand over the floor to Sally to talk about our resources. Thank you, Johan. Um, we've created some resources for libraries and institutions to use to help their researchers. Um, so in addition to the infographic that Johan demonstrated on a previous slide, there's a handout that you can add your organisational details to and then reproduce and freely distribute to your researchers. We've also created some slides. So we've got a, a single slide that gives a useful summary of the rights retention strategy. Now that's really helpful if you've sort of got a three minute slot in a university committee meeting where you've been asked to describe the whole strategy. <clears throat> I know having done that, it uh, can be quite uh, stressful. So we, we, this is a very sort of quick overview that you can use. And then there's a more fulsome five slide deck with more details on it that you can also use. And again, these are freely available. You can download all these resources from the Coalition S website. I should also mention while we're talking about this that we've published some practical advice about the technical requirements for repositories. 
this is also on the Coalition S website, it should help institutions with the implementation of their repositories and how they can meet the Plan S requirements. And many of the, re the requirements that are up there are sort of standard aspirations for repositories in any case, but there's just some clarification there um, to help you. Plus uh, another little um, shout out here for the Coalition S uh, blog that is up there. It's called Soapbox. I think it's a really nice name actually, but it's uh, the, the Soapbox on the Coalition S website. And that's currently um, uh, running a series all about repositories and some of the benefits uh, that repositories offer, which many of you will know anyway, but I think it just backs it up. But it also shows how um, Coalition S is, report, is supporting the repository option. And the final part, which will be um, published next week, I think, is um, going to be about the rights retention strategy and how that fits with the, the green route, the repository route to open access. With that, I'll hand back over to, uh, to Johan. Okay, thank you, Stanley. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, legal issues. Um, I'm not going to repeat the, the um, incomprehensible legal language here, but the question that always arises from a legal perspective, how does this work? Well, it basically, the way I understand it, um, I mean, is that it works by prior license. The CC by license applied by the author basically works as a previous contract that has to be respected by the publisher. Um, it's basically like with any contract, if for a, even for renting a house or for any other contract, if there is a previous contract that and that the, the later uh, contract, a later contract holder uh, uh, knows of, uh, then that contract has to be respected. Uh, and this is the same here. The, the idea is the CC BY license applied by the author is an earlier uh, copyright license uh, applied by the author. If the, uh, if the publisher knows about this subsequently, they have to respect that earlier license as the, as the prior license. That means that it takes precedence legally over any later copyright agreement that the author might be asked to sign or even any he or she has signed. If there is an, a pre-existing uh, contract that the publisher knows about, has been informed about, then that one applies. Uh, this is why we insist so much on the communication aspect of this, because we have to, we as funders, uh, want to inform the uh, publishers that this applies. And of course, it's, since uh, publishers cannot know who our individual authors are that are supported financially by coalition as, the, uh, uh, the authors themselves also have to remind the, the publisher that this applies to them and that this earlier CC BY license uh, takes precedence uh, or implicitly takes precedence over any later copyright agreement. So that's how it works legally, if you like. Um, the question that also uh, often arises is, is the initial submission itself also covered by the CC BY license? Well, it is not actually. But what is the only thing that is important is that the author informs the journal that, that, that uh, any author accepted uh, manuscript version that arises from the submission, namely after peer review, that that will be al already licensed CC BY because of the contract, you know, basically because of the contract of the, of the author with the, with the funder. But I have to insist here that an author who is not part of Coalition S, any author basically, any institution, could also require this of the publisher, could apply this. An author can take it upon himself to say, I, the author, claim a CC by license on the AAM arising from this submission. And that is why uh, Sally and I also uh, disseminate this um, approach so widely, because it is not strictly applied to, uh, not strictly uh, the property of, of, of uh, Coalition S to do this. This is also something that anyone, anyone can apply in the world. And of course, one of the reasons we want to disseminate this is that we want more support for this strategy because it makes sure that authors retain their rights and that more uh, material will become available immediately upon publication in, in repositories, which is, which is of course what, what we want. So very important to underscore, uh, anyone can do this. Um, 
Uh, then final uh, final uh, frequently asked question is, what if there is a disagreement with the publisher? Well, now that is where a coalition as a funded author, of course, has a small advantage. Namely, we want to be able to communicate with the publishers in the case, in case there is a disagreement. So we advise uh, uh, authors or the libraries acting on their behalf to contact the funder and the funder will take this up with, uh, with the publisher in case of disagreement. Okay. Um, uh, Sally, can I hand over to you here for the... Yes, I'll just, just add to that last point um, about the disagreement with publishers that um, authors are not expected to investigate. And I think that's really exactly. important that, um, that they're not um, expected to do that. Um, but the repositories, um, the, the, for the repository managers, the onus on sort of investigating what has happened will be picked up by the funder there rather than them having to do the investigation. They may have to reply to the, the publisher who's issued a takedown policy, but it's not up to them to investigate. And also just to clarify that this is for Coalition S funded people. Coalition S funders are not particularly keen on picking up any disagreements with people who um, have problems where they're not funded by Coalition S. <laughs> no, we, can't do, we can't do anything there, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. But it so, is important to know Note that uh, uh, researchers are not expected to take up this fight. Uh, we yeah. will do that for them. Yeah. And so there's loads of information on the Coalition S website. This slide here gives you links, um, and I'm sure Stephen can um, put those around later on so you don't have to copy them down. Um, they, these are links here where you can find out much more information all about this. And we're always happy to, to um, take questions from you if you're still stuck. Um, I would encourage you to do that. And as Johan was saying, you know, even if you're thinking about it for um, non coalition S funded people, the information on the website there may help you just to sort of with your thought processes uh, for thinking about how you might talk to researchers about that. So I will leave you to go and investigate all those web links. Yes, and of course uh, we are giving our, our own information there. We have also a legal specialist on board, Neha Vias, who can uh, inform you, uh, give you more information about the, the legal process itself. And with that, I think I'll stop sharing and we can start uh, the discussion. And there's probably a number of... Indeed. Th th thank you very much, Johan. Thank you, Sally, for, for this introduction. Um, so I've already seen there's already a couple of people who have been putting questions into the Q&A uh, box, which is excellent. That's exactly what, what, what we want. Um, to start the discussion, we're happy to have a couple of lead respondents who will engage in conversation with you, Johan, Sally. And the first of these is Dr. Al-Walid al, -Walid al who's the Senior Intellectual Property Librarian at Qatar National Library. So let's, over to you, Waleed, and we'll have about 10 minutes of discussion and then go over to, to Dr. Agu. And uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I'd like to thank the speakers for the presentation and I'd like to thank Stephen and Ifla for extending this invitation to Qatar National Library. I think I need to adjust the camera, but, <laughs> but it goes that without saying that we in Qatar National Library believe that the mission of opening, I mean, we believe in the mission of opening up scholarly communication, open access is definitely key. And we've been working with, you know, several international publishers in the last couple of years and have some of the first transitional read and publish agreements in the region, as well as an open access fund. You know, with that said, as many as other counterparts in the region, uh, we have issues not always having kind of open access friendly publishing agreements and having to deal with the kind of financial constraints um, of rising demand of open access publishing and ever increasing APC costs. Um, with the rights retention strategy, we welcome it. So we welcome this approach and as outlined by Planas, and we believe that this may be a practical alternative in the absence of gold open access options. And you know, we also believe that it may, it may act as a catalyst for publishers to provide more equitable and favorable agreements for us in the region moving forward. And we hope that's the case. We do have some observations and questions, you know, for planners related to how this approach may be applied um, in general, but also more specifically to us in the region. And with the region, I mean, you know, Qatar and surrounding countries and the Middle East. For this to work, researchers and institutions need repositories. And the problem is that there's a general lack of open institutional repositories in Qatar and the region as a whole. And we think that is a, a quite 
uh, a challenge or a, a big obstacle. Once this kind of infrastructure uh, hurdle is addressed, there are of course other issues for Plan S to work uh, or an alternative to Plan S with similar kind of uh, motivations to work in the region. There's a general kind of um, lack of acceptance of open access, I would say. Still, there's a struggle. I mean, even though we've moved away of why open access should be should be used to how, but still, it, there's a general kind of uh, misinformation around open access. And I would say that extends not only from research, but to all the funding agencies and institutions. There's a general lack of kind of support for open access, kind of, and that's shown by the, the number of policies in the region. It's really that um, low. You know, concerning repositories, we hope that the rights retention strategy framework allows for the flexibility for authors to add uh, the, the content in or the text related to CCBY, even if there's a um, if there's no institutional repository, which can come later on. We do hope, you know, that uh, there's flexibility with uh, the choice of repository, uh, which we suspect is the case with the CCBY mm -hmm. license. It can allow for basically anywhere um, to be placed. Looking specifically here in Qatar, uh, the biggest university is Qatar University, and it does have a repository already. And we as Qatar National Library are working on developing a national one. And, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, we could in the next year or so meet with local stakeholders and have a national pl policy that is plan as compliant. Given kind of the, the number of universities and the size of the national output, it's quite feasible, we believe. I think it's just a matter of getting people together, which is uh, sometimes a challenge in its own. But our understanding, and this is where it comes kind of a general um, feedback on Plan S, our understanding is that there's a push for gold open access. And our understanding, and hopefully, I mean, correct us if we're wrong, is that right retention strategy is an alternative only for the moment until like things come together from publishers to give better agreements and work together with libraries and national institutions. And if you look at the best case scenario for Plan S, is it that, and is the question, is it that all articles published eventually are gold open access? And that agreements with publishers move away from the access and kind of focuses more on the publishing element? Because if this is the case, and it's a theoretical kind of um, scenario, and it's, I mean, it's a future scenario which we don't think, we don't expect to happen anytime soon. But if it does happen, the question is, what is the solution for authors from countries uh, who, and funders who can't afford uh, gold open access? And if this is the case, then low income, middle income countries, and even high income countries without kind of national mandates or policies are disadvantaged. Mm. So um, we believe, you know, a successful kind of plan as approach would make kind of the preprints and repository option a long-term option and not just kind of um, an interim solution to address an issue that we have right now of publishers not giving agreements that are favorable. Other issues that we think that we have are that, you know, institutions in the region, um, Qatar and elsewhere in the region, still value legacy journals, you know, they're, they're kind of the, uh, the uh, valuing the importance of impact factors. And yes, open access journals do have impact factors, but they're not giving enough credit for open access publications. And we believe, you know, like for Plan S to work globally and more specifically here in the region, that kind of alternative assessment criteria for funders would be, should be part of kind of the framework. Um, you know, we do hope also that eventually that new business models are adopted as well. Um, I mean, I think we need to look into publishing as well as not accept how it's been done. And I, I think we all agree on the step that it should change. But like, you know, like new business models that allow for gold, maybe allow for kind of more opportunities from everywhere in the world to participate in gold open access publishing, such as decoupling the editorial process from hosting and kind of access, or maybe even much more affordable gold open access options. And with that said, you know, I, I just want to kind of summarize and that, you know, the CCBY licensing for accepted man manuscripts is something that would definitely help but it needs, and we believe that it needs to be a long-term option and not just a, simply a move right now to force uh, publishers' hands. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Yes, can I briefly answer this and maybe Sally can, can, can 
complete what I'm saying. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's not it, it's it's not so much that we are aiming for a gold open access world. We are open. We are aiming for a, a world in which everything will be open access, regardless of the color. That is very important. The, what is um, what is true is that we are willing to pay for academic publishing. We are we recognize that there is a fee to be paid for the services rendered. Right. Um, we want that to be uh, fair and equitable. So that is also why we have developed our price and services transparency framework, uh, trying to ask the publishers to, to, to give a breakdown of their prices so that we know what we are paying for. And we hope that that will rekindle uh, competition amongst the publishers. What you say about gold and uh, is primarily, I think, uh, applies to the, the APC model, right? I mean, an APC for an article is, is a very strange beast. It's, um, I mean, commercially speaking, uh, right? Because it's a single price worldwide for the same service. I mean, there's very few uh, services or, or products that, that, that do that. I mean, you know, even, even an, an iPad doesn't cost the same in, in New Delhi and, uh, and in Oslo, right? Uh, um, or, you know, think of price, uh, airline price tickets or any other, any other service. Coca-Cola. Uh, so the APC is an exception to that. You know, it's basically a price that's set in the north, right? And uh, e even though some of the, the work that's being done is done in the south, I mean, everybody knows that type, typesetting is done in India these days, right? So, so the price is set in the north. Uh, this is something that we have to look into. We, we really have to look at uh, different business models to see how we can all uh, contribute equitably to, 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 the, uh, to academic publishing. There was a study uh, that I read recently, for instance, that if you if you look at the, the discrepancy between what an author uh, is, is able to, to pay for in terms of APCs in, in, in Africa, uh, as opposed to um, as opposed to, for instance, uh, uh, let's say in, uh, South Korea, that discrepancy is about a, a factor 12. So, you know, for every article at a, at a median APC that an African researcher could publish, uh, uh, a, North, a South Korean uh, author would be able to, to publish 12 articles. So that, that's a huge discrepancy. That's really something that we need to address. We will probably launch a, a study on this uh, and bring together a, a discussion group to see how we can mitigate that kind of thing. One of the first things I think is that the author should not be the one to pay. Uh, the author should not be presented with an invoice. We should have a mechanism that, that takes that, that burden away from the author directly. And then you have to have a mechanism that takes into account size of institution, uh, um, uh, purchasing power, uh, purchasing power uh, as, as well, uh, in terms of the contribution, so that everybody contributes, not so much that there are waivers, which we don't want, because I mean, they function like handouts, basically, but that everybody contributes as a as, as, as a factor of their means. That is something that we are trying to think about. I mean, we're trying to think about what the world of publishing could look like five or 10 years from now, so that we all equitably <laughs> equitably uh, pay for, uh, for academic publishing. We also expect back the results very soon now of a diamond publishing uh, study uh, that should be available in a, in a few in, in a few weeks so diamond publishing is publishing where neither the author nor the uh, nor the reader pays but where uh, publishing is basically done either by the community or by institutions financed by 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 public public funds and i think it will also be very interesting to see what comes out of that what the uh, the, the input, the, the financial input is, is that is necessary to uh, keep uh, diamond publishing uh, going. So I think there are alternatives and we need to, we need to discuss them uh, more fully. But we definitely would not want to go towards a world where, you know, there are very high APCs just set by the North and that, that exclude half, 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 of the, half of the world from publishing at, at all. That is definitely not what we have in mind for the public pu publishing world uh, 10 years from now. Shall I add to that, Johan? Um, um, you've made some really good points there um, from the perspective of Qatar. Um, I should say that although um, Coalition S, um, the funders there, um, as a general rule, they, they like to um, stress to publishers, you know, that they recognize that um, the version of record has had some value added to it in what a, a publisher does to it. But I, I 
would also say, as I said in the, the blog that I wrote, that they also are a, a mixed group of funders and they do actually within them have some preferences and I think are um, more and more aware of the preferences around the globe. Like some countries, Latin America is the, the obvious one to, to give as an example, um, where there is a clear preference for the um, what we call the green routes to open access via repository. And also um, some countries where the ability to pay an APC is just at the current prices is not is really not on. So um, this is this is one reason why the uh, rights retention strategy has come in, but also again to really stress this idea of authors keeping control of their own accepted manuscripts so they can do with it what they want. It gives them that freedom and I think it stresses that. And one thing which I would just be interested to know about um, is the um, deals that are um, being created with, with publishers in Qatar and other countries. Um, you know, when a, when a deal runs out, say, you know, if you've got a, a set number of APCs that are paid under that deal and it's for one year, when that sort of runs out, when all the APCs have been used, you know, is that something that could go into the deal agreement? You know, when the, when the number of APCs have been used up, we are going to flip to having fully, um, fully open green, immediate open access green. And also as, as part of the deal that is struck with a publisher to say, yeah, we want this in our deal. We want to be able to do this. I don't know if that would be something. And then, you know, while, while you're getting your repositories going, allowing people to put it on university websites or the national repository. I think the idea of your national repository is great. So let's, let's wait, fingers crossed, we'll see that sometime soon. I'll stop there. So um, thanks for the question. So, I mean, I can comment uh, on the Qatar agreements. I can't comment on other agreements that have the, and, and that's actually a point that I would like to refer to is that agreements are different and, and you know, from one publisher to another, but maybe sometimes with the same publisher, but from one country to another. So one thing that we believe in, in with Qatar National Library is full transparency when it comes to agreements and to our best as, of our efforts, every, Every, it's kind of our policy right now that we don't have the confidentiality removed. So basically we can give back to the community because we have learned from published agreements elsewhere. So we believe in that cause. And so that transparency for agreement is something that we believe in. Um, to answer your question about um, kind of flipping or going back to the green, again, it's every agreement is different. And we do have a set of policies that we try to kind of um, basically uh, standardize our approach. But of course, it, it depends on uh, every publisher. But in general, uh, we calculate uh, the APCs based on historical account plus a kind of 5 to 10% growth. And in many cases, that has been kind of accurate, except, you know, like a, a, a good thing that came out maybe in 2020 is that authors published more. So we had this issue where we kind of ran out of APCs. But that's a good problem to have. It just means that people, people are publishing more. And in also when it comes to the green or repository kind of policies, it also changes from one agreement to another. And that's something um, we also would like to mention is that from a legal perspective, some agreements specify the license of the accepted uh, author accepted manuscript. And in some agreements it says, well, one of the agreements that I have in mind is with the major publisher, the AM is under CC, BY, and C, and D. And you know, and that's something we have, if we want to adopt this, we have to ad address because we need to address that in future agreements or have an addendum. So it, it varies from one publisher to another, but we are aware of that the repository route is maybe the more sustainable option long-term, especially when we run out of APCs. Well, we can't, exactly. So that's something that we are aware of and working on. And I do hope that by having the transparency and agreements, we can share this knowledge with other um, regional counterparts. Thank you for this. I'd like now to hand over to Dr. Reggie Raju, uh, from, who's Director of uh, Research and Learning Services at the University of Cape Town, in order to give your responses, your reactions, and to ask questions to Johan and Sally. Dr. Raju? Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I must say that the rights retention, the principle, is brilliant. But I have problems with the fundamentals of, of this whole thing. Um, and again, I'm coming from South Africa, I'm coming from an African perspective. 
And I think I'm fairly active both in the country and the continent. Um, and, and, and my views are not representative only of the University of Cape Town. In fact, I think um, my views may be contrary to the University of Cape Town because the University of Cape Town is one of the more affluent universities on the African continent. But be that as it may, I, I, I must go back to the fundamentals. Um, when the open access movement started, we all said, yay, this is brilliant. It is a philanthropic movement that provides opportunity for research to be shared to further research. And all of us bought into this. But what we have done in, in South Africa and Africa, we've converted that into a social justice process. We are talking about being inclusive. We are talking about breaking down barriers. We are talking about demarginalization. We are talking about decolonization. We are talking about denorthernization of the publishing landscape. And we now looking at these kinds of opportunities. Uh, and, and hence our, um, our support for the Hope and Access Movement and our seeing within the movement, the whole concept of growth and development. But what happened next was that the fund, uh, the, the, the publishers came up with this concept of article processing charges. And that shot our legs right off because we can't afford to pay those APCs. So what we've done is we've taken a philanthropic movement with social justice principles and we now developed it into a business model. And the unfortunate thing is that APCs and unfortunately Coalition S is supporting that makes this now a business model that entrenches everything that we've been fighting about. It entrenches marginalization, it entrenches um, exclusionary practices, it entrenches all of these issues. So here we talk about rights retention. And as I said, I buy into that principle but I buy into other principles for me, which are far more important. Here we're talking about building a wonderful roof, but the walls and the floor are crumbling. The walls and floor represent the open access movement because what's happening is we're not addressing the imperatives that come, that, that Africa has to deal with and South Africa has to deal with. And everybody talks about the fact that Africa produces less than 1% of the world's knowledge production. We produce so little. It's not because we're producing so little. We're producing so little in terms of the pathways we have in terms of sharing this knowledge. There are numerous barriers that African researchers need to address or need to overcome to have their articles published. We, we're all fighting for the same space in the journals and understandably, the publishers are wanting to publish that which sells. And if Africa is not buying, then we cannot gonna be able to sell it. It's simple economics. So all of this that we're looking at where, does, where is this taking us? How is coalition going to provide this kind of impetus that will allow us to, to at least allow our, our research to become out in the open so that we can also benefit from rights retention? Because what do we retain? We got no opportunity to retain anything. And, and a researcher myself, when you apply for a grant from the same, very same uh, uh, funders, the first thing is to ask you, do you have um, a link to the Americas or the UK or wherever else? So you're always on the back foot. 
So as much as this is a brilliant strategy, what does it mean for us in Africa and South Africa? Now, Johan talked about transformation, uh, transformative agreements. In South Africa, we have taken a decision as a collective that we're not going to sign transform uh, transformative agreements, but what we are going to work towards is what we call transformational agreements, where we want to transform the publishing landscape. Because that publishing landscape is what needs to be transformed if we're talking about all the principles of decolonization, demarginalization, exclusionary practices, we need to transform that publishing landscape. So my, my point here is how does Coalition S in terms of this retention strategy, how does that, how do you see that as unfolding on the African continent? Well, I mean, to, to speak very directly about the rights retention strategy, I think it is a great strategy to apply on the African continent because it allows uh, people who uh, would normally publish in subscription journals and not pay or behind the paywall side of an uh, open access uh, of an um, of a hybrid journal for which they pay nothing uh, to immediately publish the article in uh, to immediately publish that article in open access via the rights retention strategy because the article will become available in the, in the repository so that is where I think the, the contribution of the rights retention strategy lies and you can publish in a subscription journal and of course that means that the article is behind the paywall but you, you retain the right to deposit that very article in a repository and that repository should be available uh, worldwide for everybody to see and uh, you can you can refer to it um that okay, i can think you notice this to that you want, please excuse me if i may yeah I, I i think again the assumption one is making is that um the 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 publishing landscape um is is open and that is actually not true there are prejudices. Oh, no, you, no, you, you asked me how the rights retention strategy contributes to making research open. I, I gave you a, a clear answer. The rights retention strategy is one of our policies. I, it's not the last word by any means. I agree with you that the system as, as it is, 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 is broken, uh, that it costs okay. a lot, that it is exclusionary, that it is colonialist. That is also why I said we are, we are looking into ways of, 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 of changing that. Um, once the current period is over, right now we are living in a period of change. We are living in a period where they, you have uh, transformative agreements, where you have APCs, where you have diamond publishing, where have, you have, you know, at least 10 different models of, of, of paying for academic publishing, right? Either through government schemes uh, for, for diamond, for instance, or via APC, which I think is very unfair. I think we all agree that we want to get rid of the APC, right? But something else has to yes. co come to place. Yeah? Something else has to has has to be built. We are not going to to do away with traditional commercial publishing from one day to the next. I mean, some some people hope that, but I, I don't think that's that's realistic in any way. I mean, uh, I mean, none of us like these very high APCs. The, the, the trouble is how do you move away from them? And that's why Coalition S is trying a, a, a systemic approach. Also, for instance, our principle 10 is, is about DORA. Uh, it's, a, it's about not making those, those very high-end uh, journals as, as important as they are. Huh? Uh, uh, Nature, science, you know, uh, uh, Lancet. Um, making, making it clear that where the research is published, is no longer important for the funders and also act accordingly, namely in the sense that the funders have agreed that this is a principle that they hold dear. So that means that over the years, as the years go by, the so-called prestige of these journals will, will diminish and where the, where you what you publish will be much more important than where you publish. So that is a systemic change, but we can't do everything at the same time, right? I mean, I think we all agree there is a 
cost to publishing, what that cost, what that co that, and that that cost should be fair and equitable. We we have a policy for that. We have a policy for making prestige journals more important, but we have to pull all of these things at the same time, and th that is what we are trying to do. Uh, uh, and uh, it is also true that at this, that, that given this 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 multiplicity of of, of policies, we, we we cannot simply stop paying for APCs from one day to the next. It is it is part of the landscape, and it is something that we will have to wind down and and find alternatives for and and that is something that we are that we are really trying to do so i think the goal that you have in south africa and the goal that we have is 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 exactly the, is exactly the same the advantage of of being in a coalition like coalition s is that you have many experts from all these organizations uh, that are joined and that think collectively about this uh, uh, about what the future should look like and that is for me at least one of the great advantages of coalition as it's also why i joined is you have this unique set of expertise of people from from various countries and various backgrounds and various uh, and various income uh, incomes thinking together about a, a way to move forward uh, uh, phase out certain uh, certain types of payment like, like like the APC and think about uh, think about an equitable uh, publishing model for the for the future so I, I I do think we agree on on the ultimate goal uh, yeah I, I think where we have a problem is in the process the ultimate goal sure. I fully support um, mm. but the process, Sorry, Stephen. Exactly, I don't but to, this is also, you, but Edgy, uh, understand me well. This is also why I think, for instance, you know, uh, people can adopt some of our policies and not others. For instance, the rights retention strategy is a is a very simple strategy that anyone can adopt to make sure that those articles that now disappear behind the behind the subscription paywall without being visible become visible at least for now. I mean, it's not it's a stopgap solution. It is not the ultimate solution. Okay. That's, I, I, I think I should be, I should stress that. It's one way of moving forward now, but it is, will that still exist five or 10 years from now? Well, hopefully not. I mean, <laughs> hopefully we will have then a, a solution that uh, where, you know, the publication in an open access journal is the standard and uh, the author is not bothered by the payment and the payment is commensurate with the, uh, the, the, the income of the country and the size of the institution and and that's it uh, and, and and the article is immediately available in open access and and everybody finds this the most normal way of, of proceeding yeah. that is the future that I have in in mind there, there is a cost let that cost be met by solidarity across countries can I chip in as well Johan sure. um, just just to add to that I mean you've you you've put it extremely eloquently um, Reggie, you know, you're the, the problem that you face. And I think you're pushing at an open door there. You know, I, I think everybody agrees with you 100% there. Um, I, I think one of the problems is that Coalition S can't change the whole publishing environment in one go. I think everybody's agreeable, as Johan says, that this, this system is broken as it stands. Um, I think also one of the things that, that I always keep in my mind is the far horizon which I think goes for everybody. And this is the sort of general direction that open scholarship and open science is going into. I mean, it can be argued, you know, what's the, what's the, um, the future of the, the journal article even. Um, and I think, you know, things like um, preprint servers and open peer review, like you get from something called PCI, Peer Community In, that is offering an overlay peer review on preprint servers. And I think that is a really interesting area, which mm. um, does not cost as such, you know, it's, it's taking the elements of the whole process mm. and, and building them together in a slightly different way. And I think that's something that we can all watch and yeah. will be very interesting to see. And yeah, then once you've, exactly, got, yeah. we, we, then once you've got your peer reviewed art article, it's been, you can then submit it to any journal you like. It's already been peer reviewed or not, you know. So I think that's that's something to watch. Sorry, yeah, I think, I think what we have especially seen that in the context of, of COVID research, for instance, suddenly preprints became enormously important. I mean, if, if there's anything that uh, that that changed in 2020 with respect to with respect to open access it was i think the importance of the preprint suddenly you know the preprints 
took over basically. Uh, so that's one thing. And like Sally says that this is typical or, or show something about the way in which the, the, the publishing landscape is, 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 is changing. Before, in fact, all the processes, uh, you know, from initial submission to the produced article, all those processes were in the hands of the publisher. That is no longer the case. You see a, a, an increasing atomization of the processes, right? Uh, atomization, uh, for instance, and you have a preprint, a preprint is on the site, it's openly accessible, then you have peer review, which formerly was in the hands of the of, of, of the publisher, that gets uh, taken back by the community and performed for free by the community. And get so the article gets a stamp of approval of those reviews. And so in, in a certain way, publication increasingly becomes an afterthought in a way, right? Uh, and increasingly an afterthought for which publishers will not be able to claim as, as, as much money as they, as, they, as they used to because they are no longer performing the services that they used to, that they used to uh, provide. So, so that's why I think the, 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 the evolution is going, you know, yeah. and a, a, an increasing atomization of the, of the various processes um, with, um, yeah, with less emphasis uh, on, on, on the added value that publishers provide. But that is my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Johan, you talked about diamond open access, and I think that is what um, is fast gaining momentum in mm. South Africa and Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we have just launched a continental platform based on diamond open access publishing. So I think there are opportunities for Absolutely. coalition to work Mm. Yes. As I said, we, we have this diamond study, I mean, that we are anticipating any day now, uh, so it should be become available, I think, by mid-February, uh, the, the results of that, and then we will have to think uh, seriously of how we are going to how we are going to support that as as funders, because it is an important part of the publishing landscape, that 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 is that is really mightily uh, undervalued uh, for now, because everybody you know has this has their eye on the prestige publishers, but um, but diamond diamond journals uh, provide um, uh, an incomparable service that that really needs to be recognized more, and that we need to find mechanisms for so so that we can maintain it. That that's a really good message to, to, to end on. I think this fact that we do have, there is this flexibility, this possibility to look at those models that work for everyone. I realize we've run just over time, but before we close, um, firstly, I want to say thank you from, from IFLA headquarters to Johan, to Sally, to Awali, to Reggie for your contributions. We will we'll be putting the recording of this webinar up online. And so that will have the slide, the email addresses, if you have further questions. In order to close, I wanted to invite Gulchin Crib, who is the chair of our academic and research library section, without whom this uh, webinar would not have been possible. So I will invite Gulchin to say some closing words. Gulchin. Thank you, Stephen. You're very generous and very kind. Thank you. Good evening from East Coast of Australia. Um, and I, I'm just delighted that we could have this webinar series and uh, it's really Stephen who put it all together. I'm grateful to Sally and Johan. Uh, and this is the second one. I attended the first one for Asia and Oceania. Unfortunately, I can't attend the Latin America one because it's tomorrow morning for me. <laughs> and I found uh, each of these webinars incredibly insightful and really helpful. And it's really helping to advance our thinking, sharing of information. It's quite a complicated area and, um, and we really need to keep debating this and discussing it and, and, and understanding it because as Johan said, this is really investing for the future. It's really looking at the next five years and 10 years. So there's no immediate solutions, but we're working towards it. And it's been a wonderful discussion. So I want to thank uh, Sally and Johan, Coalition S for coming together to offer this webinar and Stephen for putting it together. And our wonderful lead respondents, Dr. Alevid Alkaja from Qatar. And of course, our very own Dr. Reji Raju, who is a member of Academic and Research Library section of IFLA. And thank you for the collaboration. And I'm looking forward to the recording of the third one. So I won't be there in person. Good night from Australia. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very Thanks much, Paul. Thank, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Sally and, and Johan and Steve. And thank you very much for this debate. And I hope, I sincerely hope, that we can continue this debate and mm. find solutions that would allow Africa onto the publishing landscape. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. Goodbye.